All right, there's still a few people trailing in, but I think we can go ahead and get started, and people can still come in and find a spot. Um, everybody's here for Art Fair Boot Camp, correct? You're in the right place. Um, all right, so my name is Sarah German. I am actually the Education and Outreach Coordinator here at the Doherty Art Center, um, but I am also a artist, um, and I do a lot of art fairs. Um, so I'm a ceramic artist, and I've been doing fairs and festivals for about 12 years now. I have scaled back since I work here full time, but um, I've gained a lot of experience of the do's and don'ts and what works well and what doesn't. So um, before we kind of dive into everything, is there anybody that has never been here? A few people? Welcome. Um, there was flyers up there talking about some artist opportunities um, that we've got coming up, um, including various ones. There's a community pop-up program. Um, we do have a visual artist residency that the application is open for right now for ceramic artists and um, photography, darkroom. It's a work exchange program where we give free access to our studio in exchange for working some hours for the week. Um, Emerging Teaching Artists is a program we do in collaboration with um, a nonprofit here in town called MindPop. Um, and that application is open for artists that does have a stipend that comes along with it. Um, and it's basically a six week class teaching artists how to teach. Um, so you can look at that one. Our gallery call is open right now. So if you think you want to fill a gallery space, there you go. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, a flyer of all of our workshops. So this is actually a monthly workshop series. Um, we change the topic every month. We've repeated some, but this is our, we just started our third year doing this. Um, so we've kind of gained some traction and done different topics, brought in different speakers. So it's not me all the time. Uh, but yeah, so we've got different ones coming up. We actually have a second one coming up this month, um, which is the Art of Taxes. And Texas accountants and lawyers for the arts are going to be here um, to give that workshop. And it's actually the same woman that came last year, and it's amazing. So if you want to know how to do your taxes, if you're trying to make money off of your artwork, and you are making money off of your artwork, you're supposed to report it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then finally, our call for artists for our art festival that we started doing here last year, which um, was called Spring, Fr Spring Fling last year. And we've now rebranded it to Artorama, but um, yes, we'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, okay, so housekeeping, welcome. There was sign-in. Um, there was also a survey back there by the sign-in that we would love for you guys to fill out at the end and turn in. Um, it's how we keep getting funding for doing these things. Um, bathrooms are out that door. Everybody's an adult, I will not judge. You don't need to ask, just go. Um, let's see here, what else? And then if you wanna ask a question, just hands up and we'll, we'll address it. If it's something that I'm gonna talk about later, I'll just let you know that we're gonna address it here in a minute. All right. Okay, how many people here have actually done a fair or a festival? Oh, good. Okay, so if you have something to add, please add it as well. Um, so art fairs are a great way for artists to start out um, showing their work, and it's also a great way to get a lot of people to see your work. Um, it's also a great way to be seen by gallery and shop owners that um, might be coming to look for new artists to represent. Um, I know that happened to me right out of college. I went to an art festival and a gallery contacted me. Um, actually, that happened twice um, and asked to carry my work. So it's a great avenue to get your work out to a wider audience and leads to other opportunities as well. Um, there's different levels of art festivals depending on how, you want, how into it you want to get and how much of an investment. Um, I will add, sorry, that was a more housekeeping thing. I will put this PowerPoint online. Um, and the website I'll put it on is um, at the end of this. So don't feel like you have to rush to take notes or uh, take pictures of every slide. 
Um, so anyway, simplest form of an art fair or selling your work is a pop-up. Um, you know, this might be a particular craft show that goes around, such as like uh, here there's Austin Flea, um, Craft and Draft. Um, the South Congress one is a little more involved than those, but um, that's another example, or similar to a farmer's market or a maker's market. I threw studio tours on there um, because you know we've got east and west here and it's actually very similar. You're not actually going to some festival location and setting up, but it's similar that you have to apply and you should probably have a nice display of your work. Um, and then there's small one day fairs, kind of like what we're doing here. Um, and those are a good opportunity to kind of get your feet wet as well. And then there's large scale festivals um, that are usually pricier. Um, like Art City Austin is going to be one of those bigger ones that attracts artists from around the country. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider when you're trying to decide whether you're going to do art festivals or not. Um, number one is time commitment. Uh, making the work for it, but also the fact that you, when you go to these festivals, um, it's time away from your studio. It's time away from your studio when you're pricing the work, when you're packing all of your display, when you're driving there, so that's something to consider. Um, application fees and booth fees. So a lot of people don't realize that a lot of these shows charge you money to apply, and then also if you get in, you've got to pay for your space. We're a little bit different here, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but a lot of times, yes, you're going to pay a fee to be there. Um, travel expenses, like I said, if you're going to go to a show that's not local, um, you're going to pay gas, you're going to pay lodging probably, unless you sleep in the back of the van like I used to do. Um, so there's all that stuff to look into. Um, a booth setup, how far, how big it is, how far you can take it, that sort of thing. And if you're really cut out to sell your own work. Um, so small festivals versus big festivals, I've kind of said some of this already, um, but the pop-ups are great um, to get started with. Um, they're usually affordable to do um, if they cost at all. And then um, it's also less of a time commitment and then you're usually going to be local too unless you've got a pop-up that you found out of town that you think would be worth doing. Um, bigger shows usually bring more money um, and they're usually longer. Uh, but they are time away from your studio, and obviously, usually they have higher fees as well, um, and then your travel costs along with them. And then similar is local versus national, like I kind of said. Um, so local shows, obviously, accessible um, and easy to start off with. Um, they sometimes have an application or booth fee, but if they do, it's generally low. Um, and then they're a good place to get started and are useful for trying out different setups and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about setups in a little bit as well. <coughs> Sorry, allergies, which I'm sure everybody else is dealing with. Um, and then there's national shows. Um, if you're an artist that likes to travel, that's great. There's artists that you know spend a certain time of the year, usually the winter, making work. And then they apply to shows all summer long, and they get in their van or RV or whatever, and they just travel all summer. Um, if that's what you dig, then that's a good thing. But um, usually the shows are um, cost more, like I said, um, and, and then you have higher expenses. And then um, if you can stay with family or friends too, if that's a good way to start traveling and doing shows. Um, and it, it obviously cuts down on expenses. Um, but the best thing about traveling and doing the shows is it helps bring your work to a wider audience and expand your buyer and collector base. And so people that have seen it around town because you've been doing it, you know, maybe they've bought their pieces and they're done. So you're, you're reaching out to a new audience. All right, so how do you find shows? Um, I put local event listings on here. Stuff like Facebook events, Eventbrite, um, Do512, just social media in general, and seeing, sometimes there will be actual calls, but even just seeing what shows are out there and things to do. Um, going and checking out a show might be a good idea before you apply to it, especially if it's local. Um, like I said, going to like a, an Austin Flea, I think they pop up like twice a month. 
Um, so going and checking out what that looks like. And they move around town to different places, so that's kind of cool too. Um, and then there are other, way, or other ways to find it, which um, would be call for entry websites. Um, Zapplication.org is actually a art festival website. Um, and so it's an application base, and then you, um, you it, it has all the listing. It's, it's kind of like a Craigslist for art festivals, um, except that you can also upload your portfolio on there and apply directly on the site. Um, Callforentry.org um, is another one. It's a wider one. It includes um, exhibits and, and other types of shows, but they do have a way of selecting just festivals. Um, and then callforentries.com is another one. Similar thing, you can you can search for just art festivals. Any questions? Yeah. Um, are these for fine art or maker festivals? Some of them are both. Um, it just kind of depends. Uh, and it's, it's gonna be a lot of the same, some of the other stuff that we're gonna talk about, it can go either way. The, the Zapplication, um, generally tends to be a little more fine art, but there's there's local shows on there too and, and more maker type ones as well. A lot of times they'll just want it to be handmade. But they will list a lot of times in their requirements like what mediums they'll accept. So. All right, so deciding which show is right for you and which ones to apply to, um, I recommend doing some research. Uh, like I said, especially like with uh, websites that list all the or list the shows, um, generally they have a long explanation of what the show is, what the booth sizes are, what the cost is, what the requirement is, and so you read through all of that before you decide to apply to anything. Because don't waste your time if something pops up that they're that you can't agree to and you can't do. Um, and then it's a good idea to look at the marketing that they've done for previous shows. Go to their social media. Have they posted anything since the last show? And how, how much did they post for the last show and, and promote it? Because um, it might tell you a lot about whether, or what the attendance might be, whether they're reaching out to people. Um, and then looking, is it a well-established show? Um, is it the 47th year of it, you know? Or is it the first year? We're in our second year. We're figuring some stuff out. But, um, you know, that's, that's something to look at as well. And then a lot of times, too, especially the established shows um, that they've collected data for a number of years, will be able to tell you the number of attendees that they get. And then also, um, <clears throat> the average sales for artists. But a lot of times those bigger shows too also have um, monetary awards um, for them, like a best of ceramics, best of painting. Um, and so there will be uh, monetary awards, there will be purchase awards from companies that usually have sponsors. So that's the benefit of doing some of the bigger shows, which like I said, cost more, but they usually have a bigger return. All right. So how do you apply for a show? Um, smaller shows like the pop-ups or some of the maker's marks around here, um, it might just be contacting them and letting them know that you're interested. And they're gonna say, come on out. Craft and Draft is kinda like that, I've done that one. Um, and then other shows might require you to submit an application and go through a journeying process. Um, even though we are a smaller show here with the Artorama, we, we are doing a jury process because we only have a certain amount of space and we want to make it equitable. So, um, some may require an application fee to apply. A lot of the bigger shows do. Um, so that's something to consider. Do you want to pay a fee to apply? We do not charge a fee to apply. Um, and then, let's see here. A lot of times the application process is gonna be online. I don't know of any anymore that make you send in slides. They did when I first started. It really was sucky, but. Um, and then usually you can do it through a website like the application. Um, we do ours through one called Submittable, which is similar. Um, they allow you to upload um, your images and they've got all the fields that you fill out for your information. Um, 
Some of them might do it through email and just ask you to attach the images, and I've had other ones where um, they give you a link to a like a uh, Google Drive or something, and you upload your images. Um, so, whichever method is used for the applications, like I said, be sure you read all the requirements ahead of time so that you know what materials you'll need to apply, and you won't have to repeat work. Yes. On the pictures, how? How? Like I've heard everything from just pictures with your phone, it doesn't matter to mm -hmm. it's supposed to be with the lighting, it's supposed to be five by four at the top right. of the bottom of the So right. how, does it go to that, that extreme or? Um, some do, and we'll talk about that a little bit, I think, on the next slide. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I part of what I'm getting at is make sure you read that. Um, it wasn't a festival, but it was an exhibition that I applied to that I took my images of my pieces and got ready to submit them, and then it's, I noticed it said it had to be in a square format. And here I've got a tall one that has a bottle in it that fills the whole frame, and I'm like, I can't, I can't crop that square. I've got to pull everything back out and retake that image. So just looking at that ahead of time so that you, like I said, don't repeat work. <laughs> Uh, okay, so images, obviously most of them are going to uh, ask you to submit images of your work. Some might ask for a website instead or a link to some images, but usually it'll be something where you upload them. Um, they may also require an image of your booth or setup. Um, I know not everybody has this when you start out. Um, what I've done and what I recommend people do a lot of times is mock it up in your kitchen, mock it up outside in the backyard, whatever you've got to do. Um, a lot of times what people or what juries are looking at with that is going to be, is the work cohesive? Um, is, it, is it a body of work? Is it not all over the place and looking different? Um, and then also, did you spend some time on your setup and it, it looks professional? Um, and you can, you can do professional pretty, pretty easily uh, without spending a ton of money. And we'll talk about setups here in a little bit. Um, let's see here. So, asking, yes? So, cohesiveness is a big important thing for jurors? A lot of times, yes, for shows like this. They want to see that um, your work has an identity and that it's going to look okay in your booth and mm -hmm. bring people in, so yeah. Um, so yes, as far as the uh, images, the most important thing is to make sure that they're clean with no pixelation. Um, that's not such a huge deal anymore. I mean, cameras are crazy detailed and we don't run into that too much anymore, but that's something to, to look into. And that there's nothing distracting in the background. So if you have the ability to um, crop it so that there's nothing around it, or if it's a 3D work, um, you know, maybe set a sheet behind it, if, if nothing else. Um, yes? It's important to make sure, yeah, the images look like the work that you're taking the image of. Um, there's a whole, I mean, we could talk about how to photograph your work, and we've done workshops on that before. I'm happy to answer questions later, or we do post a lot of our, our previous um, workshop slides um, on the website as well. Um, so, let's see here. Yes? Is this like in the photography you're doing? I don't think it's necessary to do it do it framed because a lot of people at festivals will sell prints, so it doesn't matter yeah. anyway. Um, and then a, a lot of times, then you've got to worry about the glass and, and all of that. So I think it's fine to either take a photo of it or to scan it, or if it was digital to begin with, you just submit the digital. Mm -hmm. or watermarks or watermarks you can Right, I would not do that for festivals. Um, I mean, it should hopefully be a reputable enough thing that you're applying to that they're not gonna steal your image, you know. Uh, and a lot of times too, and I think I say this later in the slide, they want, usually there are some requirements for the image as far as like uh, pixels and dimensions and everything, because if you're accepted, they're gonna use it as promotional material. 
Um, and usually they've got a little disclosure somewhere in there saying, you know, I agree to let you use images of my work for promotion. Uh, which is great. You want your artwork to be on the cover of their their catalog for the show, you know? Um, let's see here. Uh, the images don't have to be the exact pieces that you're going to be bringing to sell, but should be representational of the type of work that you will be bringing. Um, we already talked about the booth shot, and then um, image requirements for the application, like I just said. Um, they might have a particular size or format that they want it in. Um, obviously, Photoshop is great. Not everybody has Photoshop, um, but there, there's other free programs out there to, to crop and resize and all that. Um, we do actually, as part of our Artist Resource Center here, have um, Adobe Suite uh, that people can uh, make an appointment to come use. So um, if you're ever needing to use Photoshop, uh, hit us up. We've got a, there's a link on our website to um, ask for an appointment. Lightroom. Mm -hmm. It's very intuitive. You can do, unless you're like seriously doing photo editing, like photo mm -hmm. art, basically, you don't need Photoshop. Right. Mm -hmm. What is it? Uh, Lightroom. If you talk to the it's no problem. All right, so you've applied and now you got accepted. So what do you do now? Um, so shows will generally don't, that's a little questionable, I'll give you a date of when they're going to notify artists of acceptance. Um, if you weren't accepted, keep trying. Um, ask friends and colleagues to review your stuff um, and look at applying to different shows. Uh, and then a lot of times shows are trying to have a balance in the mediums that they accept. So if you are a jewelry artist and they got 500 jewelers that applied, they obviously cannot accept everyone. And maybe there was 100 of those 500 jewelers that were amazing, but they still can only accept 25, you know? So it's a, it's a game of numbers a lot of times too. Um, if you were accepted, uh, be sure to read all of the materials you were sent and make note of deadlines, fees, setup requirements, and any other details that seem really important. Um, because if you don't, meet some of those deadlines um, or pay some of the fees on time, you might be disqualified from uh, doing the festival. Because a lot of times, especially bigger shows, have a wait list that as soon as somebody <coughs> has not met a deadline and they are dismissed from the show, they're going to move on to that wait list and another artist is going to get your space. Um, let's see. So, I didn't make a slide for booth fees because they're so varied and sometimes there's not a booth fee, you know, that sort of thing. But um, like I said earlier, a lot of times, especially people attending a festival, don't realize that you paid for that booth space. They're like, oh, it's so nice that you set up. And it's like, uh huh. Um, I paid $500 to be here. Um, buy my work. Um, so, you know. Pay attention to um, those fees, and maybe I do have something later, because I was just about to say something, and I know I put it on here. So we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, sales tax permit. If you are selling your work, you are supposed to collect sales tax and remit it to the state. Um, if you're doing it on a regular basis, for sure, and then if you are doing um, festivals, they're gonna ask you um, for that sales tax permit number. For us, um, the way that we work with our festival, um, we don't charge an application fee and we don't charge a booth fee, but um, the city does, we are, we are part of Parks and Recreation, City of Austin, and so the city does require um, people to get a permit to sell on city property, on parkland. And so it's actually called a concessions permit, um, but it's a $50 permit. So that's, that's our fee for doing the show, is, um, is $50. Yes? No, that's for the specific event. There, there is a, because um, we do a one-time one, and that's the $50. Um, but there is an extended um, 
concessions permit, but you you could you could talk to the special events office and find out. Um, but part of getting that permit is you're required to turn in your sales tax number. So um, last year I helped a lot of artists get signed up for their sales tax and navigated that whole thing. So um, I am very familiar with it. Um, and it's, it's really not that hard. It's just getting online um, on the comptroller's website and putting in your information. If you've had a sales tax number previously, um, it will issue you the same number. Um, and then, uh, if, but if there was anything that you are, is outstanding with your previous sales tax number, you have to take care of that before they'll give you a clear number again. So, yeah, I just did mine like two weeks ago. Uh-huh. I spent probably an hour in the end code trying to figure out what the end game on T code would be. What, I mean, how many, I mean, what, it, and then I searched the internet for like, okay, here's what I do, you know, mm -hmm. what, you know what I'm saying. And right. it was like, uh, yeah, put down retail store. So. Yeah, that, I don't remember exactly what I did, um, but. They're actually really good about um, answering emails and phone calls, surprisingly. Um, but yeah, they, they do usually make you pick a category. And I honestly don't recall what I did. I think there is one for handmade art, but um, I'm not sure. I was going to say the controller's office is really good about yeah. answering questions because they know that they're dealing with the uh, in layman, but they're not dealing right. with accountants. Right. So they're yeah. really good about answering questions, mm -hmm. especially with the NAIC. Yeah, and I, we had a sales tax workshop last summer. Um, I was not here for that one. <laughs> Did you have to get a DBA first? No, no, no. Anybody else? Um, so if you travel to another state to participate in a show, um, you're going to need to obtain a sales tax permit from that state as well. Um, a lot of times, other states have temporary permits because um, they don't want to get you through that whole process and have you in their system just for one show. Um, so I'm, I'm from the Midwest originally, so I did a lot of shows in the Midwest in my younger years before I moved here. Um, like I know Wisconsin has a, a single event permit. Uh, so a lot of places do have it. Texas does not. Um, they would actually prefer you go through the whole process and sign up, and then you'd just go in and close your business. So, but like I said, then they, if you ever open it again, they reissue the same one if you're doing the same thing and calling it the same thing. Um, shows will generally let you know how much the lo local sales tax amount is, um, and then you'll need to charge that um, with each sale. Now that's up to you to decide whether you're going to apply it to the price um, or include it in the price. How I have gone in the past is if somebody's buying with cash, I include it in the price because I don't want to carry around a bunch of change. If I'm swiping a card in my app, you just put in what the sales tax is and it automatically applies it, I'm going to charge sales tax. So I, if somebody buys something for me, I always ask, are you going to do cash or card? And then I tell them how much it is. <laughs> um, but, and then there's ways of going back afterwards um, to figure out like, if you included the tax, what what was it? So um, we actually, during our festival, include like a cheat sheet so people don't have to use their calculators all the time. So um, there's ways of figuring it out, but you are supposed to be collecting it. And then it's really important to also remit it, um, which is paying it to the state, um, filing it and paying it to the state. If you have a sales tax permit right now and it's on a yearly basis, it is due on the 21st of this month. Um, I got my email the other day reminding me, which is I good. <laughs> no, in Texas, it's a $50 fee, yeah. a late fee, yeah. Um, yeah, Texas, if you don't file at all, but you have a sales tax permit, they estimate how much they think you sold by information that you enter when you get the sales tax permit. And then they're going to send you a bill. Um, and then if you file it late, you don't have to pay that bill because it'll be, you know, whatever it actually was. But then you are charged a $50 fee, even if you sold nothing. So that is the unfortunate thing with Texas. Um, other states don't do that. There is a late fee, but if you sold nothing, 
It's a percentage of nothing. So, all right, Boothbees, I did put a slide in here. Um, so when you apply to a show, they'll often ask you what kind of space you want, or booth, I keep saying booth, but it, it could be a space as well, um, and based on what they have available. Like our show here, um, we have inside spaces and outside spaces. Um, inside it's four by six, which you can generally fit a table or some shelves or a, a rack to put stuff on. Um, and then outside we have 10 by 10 booth spaces. Um, 10 by 10 is pretty typical with an outdoor show because that's the size of a lot of canopies or tents. Um, and that's just a good size and easy to figure out how many can fit in a, in a row. So um, when you are notified um, of your acceptance, that's when they usually tell you your booth space um, and then what the corresponding fee is for that booth space. Um, Usually your booth space is just the physical space. It's not going to include any walls to hang on. It's not going to include any display pieces. That's all of your responsibility. Um, occasionally you might be able to rent a tent or a table and chairs, um, but usually they charge an additional fee. Our show is a little bit different. We've got some tents that are um, available first come, first serve, same thing with tables, and then we do have chairs for everybody. So. Um, it just kind of depends. Usually a show will tell you. Um, and then your selected space um, and any additional rentals will determine your booth fee. Um, make sure you note the date of that fee um, and then what form of payment they want. I have a show that I apply to that you apply online, but then they want a check sent. So, uh, you know, you just, just be aware of those things and make sure that you're doing what they're asking. Um, and then, most importantly, think about that you have to sell enough work to cover the application and booth fee plus any travel expenses before you begin to make a profit on the show. A lot of people don't think about that. They're like, oh, great, a <coughs> festival. I get to keep everything I make rather than a gallery that's going to take a percentage. But in order to get to that 50% that a gallery is going to take, you've got to sell twice the amount of what the show costs you to do. So let's say a show costs me $35 for an application fee and $265 for the booth fee, so $300. It's in town, so I don't have to pay any travel expenses, but that still means I have to sell $600 before I'm making any profit. All right, any questions? All right, so booth design. Things to consider when you're designing a booth um, is the amount of booth space, um, which may vary depending on the show that you're doing, um, but thinking about that, uh, the type of artwork you do, 2D or 3D, if you just have a table with a bunch of paintings laying on it, that's not super ideal. So if you've got 2D work, think about vertical space and how you can, can do that. Um, Transportation, and I mean transportation of that display. Um, does it fit in your car? Uh, is it heavy? Can you put it together yourself? Ease of assembly. Um, is it adaptable? Is, do you have a glorious 10 by 10 um, design that works great, but is there stuff that you can take from it that if you get a four by six area, can you take things from that and break it down into that size? So is it adaptable? Are you making or buying things that can be used in different booth spaces? Um, structural integrity. You don't want your artwork to fall and you don't want your artwork to fall on anyone um, or the, the structure itself. Uh, and then weatherproof, um, if the show is outdoors, even if you've got a tent, keep in mind that, I don't know, let's say you made pedestals out of MDF and it starts raining, it's gonna just suck up all that water. Um, and then most importantly, can people see your artwork? Um, is it easy for them to enter your booth and take a closer look? Will it attract people from a distance? Does it look professional? Um, so just some some things to consider. That too, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, 
Um, you know, and there, there's different thoughts too about whether, so let's say you have a 10 by 10 space. Do you want people actually coming in or do you want them around and you're in the middle? It really depends and it should be, again, adaptable because it might depend on the space that you get. If you are in a corner space where there's nobody on one side of you, yeah, you could put stuff around the edge and people can walk all the way around. Uh, but if you're stuck in between two other booths, you know, that's, that's the only thing is there's one table. So you need to be able to flip it or whatever. Um, all right. So there's many great display ideas out there. I think it's great to search Google or Pinterest um, for ideas. And then also to go out to shows and see what artists that are making work similar to you, what they're doing for their displays. Um, I a lot of times go to shows and people think I'm taking pictures of their work. <laughs> I'm taking pictures of their <laughs> setups. <laughs> um, so you can go as easy as just doing tables. Um, if you're doing tables and you've got work you want people to see better, there's leg extensions you can make. Um, for just folding tables to make them a little higher. Um, you can also build your own displays. I've got a bunch of images we're going to go through here in a second. Um, and then there's also professional displays you can buy too that are modular, very easy to carry around, that sort of thing. So with these um, on the left is, you know, some shelves that obviously very easily break down, um, but are also probably pretty sturdy. Um, so that's a great way if you've got uh, three-dimensional artwork or products. Um, I liked the next one because it's pegboard, which um, we're going to look at some more expensive versions of pegboard. Um, and the next one is um, a manufactured like mesh screen that you can buy that fits 10 by 10 tents. Um, and a lot of times and then there's little hooks that go into that mesh screen that holds your artwork. The last one there is a table setup I found that I kind of liked that was really nice and clean um, and really easy to see the work. It's, it's, it's a table, but it excuse me, is vertical as well. Oh yeah, so a lot of times, yeah, people who travel and do a lot of festivals will put down a rug or um, I think that is probably like the squishy foam tiles you can get. I've seen people do that at a lot of shows too. Hmm? What do you think on that? Is that a good thing to look into? Or? It depends. Um, you want to be careful that people aren't going to trip on it and that it's accessible, that somebody in a wheelchair could roll onto it. Um, I. I've seen it where it's nice because maybe you've got a really dusty, dirty spot. You know, it'll keep from it'll keep dust from coming up the whole time you're sitting there. Um, so I don't know. It depends. I've never done it, but I've seen a lot of people who do. Yes. So many people don't sell. They refer to it as like lady has to sell rugs to sell. Did you charge more? <laughs> I was going to say, did you charge her more than you paid for it? Good job. Um, here's some other close ups of displays. Uh, somebody who's handmade, obviously, a, a tiered display. Um, next one is obviously some panels that people have made that have strings across them to hold prints upright. You know, it can be as simple as that. Uh, I'm guessing the next one is um, probably a panel that they've got that they bring with them. Um, but then in front of it, obviously, it's got some other uh, display, horizontal display space. Um, same with the next one. Um, that one actually looks like they did get a wall to be able to hang on. Um, I did like this one because beyond just the artwork, artwork, there is obviously kind of like a theme to the space as well, and that can help a lot of times with sales as people can kind of see what's going on and they're attracted to that space because there's a little bit more there visually. <clears throat> oh, yeah, let's see here. Uh, and then these are some different varieties of um, things you can buy. Uh, 
So there's grid systems you can get. Um, these grids on the left look like they're probably just um, connected to the temp frame itself um, and then resting on the ground, which is a risky thing, maybe, depending on weather. Texas is pretty okay, but um, you know, you've gotta, gotta think about, again, how sturdy is your display. Um, I've also seen where uh, those grid systems, you can get feet for them, so they're freestanding, so that's something to consider as well. Um, this is another version of the mesh um, that I was talking about. The previous one looked like it was, um, or is, I've seen them before, they attach to the actual tent frame itself. Um, this is a freestanding one. And then over here is pro panels. Um, yes? My nose is so turned over pro panels. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So pro panels are actually really nice, and you'll see a lot of people who do um, do festivals on a regular basis and do the big ones. They've invested in their pro panels, they've invested in their really nice tents. Um, it's been a long time since I've looked at the prices, but I'm guessing that, uh, I know they were very expensive before, but you can get them used sometimes, that's great. Yes? The mesh, how would I find that online? What's your... Um, I think that popped up from Diplick. Do what? I think, yeah, um, I think I, I just... Mesh display. Yeah, when I uh, pulled some of these images, I think I just typed in um, art display or art fair walls, maybe. Yes. Pro panels. P R O. Yep. Uh, and so they're you can kind of see they're modu modular. Um, they're just individual panels. Um, I'm not sure they're ex they're usually about this wide. I think probably like three by six, maybe. Um, and you can arrange them different ways with different braces. You can also make ones that look a lot like them. Um, you know, just making a wood frame and covering it in um, outdoor carpeting. So, um, but yes, those are great. Let's talk about tents. Um, if you're participating in an outdoor show, you may be required to have a tent. If you're not required to have a tent and you're in Texas still, I would recommend having a tent. Um, more serious shows, um, other, you know, like a, a pop-up or a, a craft show or South Congress, you know, they may let you use whatever tent you want. A lot of times, more serious shows that are affiliated maybe with a, an art center or museum or city or something like that um, will require them to be white. Um, and then, for example, uh, we're supposed to do it, and I know Art City Austin does it, um, the tents are supposed to be uh, fire resistant, um, so they have to have some sort of little label on them. <laughs> You're laughing so much. You can print them. <laughs> Good tip. That's probably the best tip we got all night. <laughs> nice. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> uh, tents vary all over the place, you know, there's the cheap ones, and I think they're even white from Walmart that are like 40 bucks. One gust of wind and they are going to crumple. Um, there's, and then there's a wide range of ones that are a little sturdier, that, but they're also pop-up tents. Um, and then you go to the really expensive ones, like on each side of here. One brand is Trimline, and I can't remember the other one, something dome. They also have these weights for throwing the heat. Yep. <laughs> Way ahead. Five gallon bucket full of water. Yep. Tent. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of ones that you can make. Um, but the most important thing with your tent is making sure that it's secured either through stakes or weights. Weights are better. Um, a lot of shows you might be on concrete and you can't use stakes. They might have a sprinkler system and they don't want you to use stakes. Um, so investing in some weights, either ones that you make or, or buying ones. Um, I actually have ones similar to these bags that fit around. They actually like, the pop-up tents usually have a hole at the bottom and those just have a pin that go through them and lock in and they wrap around the leg so the leg's not gonna rip out of the bag without taking it along with it. Um, I got a set for I think 30 bucks years ago. So it just depends on how much time and effort you wanna put into making them. Uh, but obviously the ones in the middle are made out of PVC. They're generally filled with concrete 
and then people will um, a lot of times either bungee or um, uh, ratchet tie them to the top corner of their tent and put them at the bottom of the leg and then secure them around the leg as well. But yes, you can also use five gallon buckets. Um, these other ones just slide over the leg, but usually they're not very heavy. You've got to put several of them on top of each other. Um, so there's a variety of ways. But you really want to do that because you don't want your work to, especially if your work is displayed using your tent, um, anchored like a lot of those those mesh ones were, you know, that sort of thing. The pro panels are on are usually attached to the tent as well. Um, so it'll damage your work. Um, and then if your tent goes blowing down the street, you're going to damage a bunch of other people's work too. We've had that happen. Not here. <laughs> at a show I was at. My partner had a bunch of his pottery broken. Uh, let's see here. Pricing your work. We're not getting into this very far because it's its own, its own whole topic. Uh, but uh, it's important to really consider how you price your work and I would 100% recommend doing it ahead of time so that you're not sitting there trying to get set up and price all your work and trying to figure out how much to price it. Is this okay? I don't know. So having it priced already um, whether that's individually with a, with a sticker price tag on it, on the bottom or on the back, whatever. Um, or uh, you could also have, uh, like if you've got a lot of similar things, like my mugs are all the same size and they're all the same price, you know, you could have a little fancy stand up that says mugs, $50, you know, or prints, $10. Um, but things to consider when you're pricing your stuff is obviously the cost of materials that you had to get to make it, um, how much time went into making the work and what you want to pay yourself hourly, um, and then market value, which means go look and see what other people are charging. Because um, if your work's similar to somebody else down the way, but you've got yours priced twice as much, you know they're probably going to go down and buy it from the other person. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I would really make it clear how much something is because a lot of times people are too nervous and they assume that a piece that doesn't have a price on it is too expensive for them and they're going to walk away rather than ask how much it is. We'll also get people that turn a, turn a piece over or look at the back and see the price and go and put it back down. I once saw um, at an art festival somebody had a sign in their booth that said, yeah, you could make it, but you won't. <laughs> so, I've always liked that one, too. Uh, Alright, preparing for the day of the show. Okay. Um, so, as you prepare for the day of the show, it's a good idea to create a checklist so that you don't forget things in the rush of trying to get everything together and get there. Um, obviously, you need your artwork and your display, but there's a bunch of other stuff that you should bring along as well. Um, business cards. Uh, payment processing, whether that be cash, um, so you've got change for cash um, or a credit card swiper. We'll talk about payment processing in a little bit as well. Um, a phone charger um, and a power brick in case you don't have anywhere to plug that charger into. Um, an extension cord, a lot of times shows won't provide electricity, but it's just good to have it just in case. Um, water and snacks, some shows will have um, refreshments for artists and have an artist lounge, but um, it's always good to have your own stuff as well because usually festivals, if there's food there, it's going to cost a lot of money and it's not going to be good for you anyway. Um, pen and paper, uh, that could be for anything you need, but it's good to have. I personally do my inventory system by pulling price tags off of the piece that I sell and putting it in a notebook and marking it down, um, so that's why I carry one around. Um, Bags and wrapping materials for when somebody, yay, made a purchase. Um, any signs or branding um, that you have for your booth. Extra price tags in case something has fallen off or you forgot to price something. Um, a chair, unless they said they provided one. And my guess is most chairs are not going to be too comfortable that are provided. They're probably a folding <coughs> chair, so if you want to bring a more comfortable chair, that's a good idea anyway. Um, and then I always take a toolkit, um, usually a screwdriver, hammer, scissors, and then zip ties and binder clips. 
can be used for anything. Uh, you said electricity is usually isn't provided. How often would you say is the wise to bring like your own separator? I've seen a lot of it depends on how important it is to your display. Um, well, I mean, just for the payment process being installed. Oh, um, depends on what you're using. If you're just using your phone, you know, you can get one of the little charging bricks, and, and generally that's fine oh, um, so to recharge it. Yeah. Or I've seen people that'll go run real quick and take their phone somewhere, and if they make a sale, they'll go grab it and bring it back. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, if your display is dependent on it, like a lot of jewelers might have cases that they light up, um, you know, then you may bring a generator with you if there is absolutely no access to electricity. Bigger shows some usually will have it though. I just wanted to mention about the generators, uh, the tent's really flexible, it's a fuse from the gas pump, so if you are going to buy one, if you can't get some other thing or set it way outside of your mm -hmm. neighbor's booth or your booth or your yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's even the ones that are just high capacity batteries as well. And with LED lights now, you know, they might, I don't, I don't know personally, but they might be able to last a good amount of time. Um, and like I said, some of the bigger shows, especially if they go into the evening, um, will provide electricity and you might have lights you consider bringing for your setup. All right, so payment processing. You should be prepared to accept most any kind of payment. I wouldn't recommend checks anymore, unless you know the person. Um, I have had a return check at a show, and so I lost the piece, and then I also had to pay a fee for the return check. So that was years ago, but just a warning. Uh, cash and credit card is going to be the most common. Um, it's a good idea to bring change with you. Um, the kind and amount will depend on how much you charge for your pieces. Like I said, if you're going to include tax or charge tax, so that will depend, determine you know, how much actual like jingly change you need. Um, and then uh, how, do you, how do you price it? Are they, is it in $5 increments? That makes it really easy because then you don't need any ones. So just thinking about that. Um, there's many credit card processing apps and swipers out there. Uh, most are going to charge a percentage for a processing fee, um, but it's usually pretty small. And then um, you can, if you know that ahead of time, um, you can take that into account when you're pricing your work. Uh, you I've might seen, add a dollar. I've seen people do that too, that sometimes you'll buy and they'll be like, and it's an extra two and a half percent for doing the card. Or right, yeah, some people will do like that, but. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think it's just so common now. Why do that? It, most everybody has started to just, it's like just bump it up a dollar. Or if it's a $2,000 piece, put, you know, another hundred bucks on it or something. I don't know. Um, some people might be able to do like the cash exchange apps like Venmo or Cash App or something like that, but just don't depend on it. You, you could put up there, you know, have a little display of, of payments types that you accept, um, but don't depend on people being okay with using that. All right, so actually getting to the show. Um, check-in and setup. Uh, shows will send you information about checking in um, and when you can start setting up. Pay attention to it because a lot of times they've done certain times for a reason. I know here we stagger um, the load in depending on where you're located in our building or outside um, and which area you load in. If you're here in the theater, we ask you to pull around back and load in the theater doors in the back um, or the stage doors. And then, you know, if you're out front in the parking lot, we had those people come in last so that they didn't have to get out of the way for everybody else coming through. Um, so they, a lot of times festivals will know ahead of time like what areas get busy and they'll try to arrange it so that uh, there's not congestion. Um, let us show if you know if you're not able to make the time that they gave you. Um, usually it's not an issue and they'll tell you what you can do, um, but that just let them know so they're not either wondering where you are or you show up and they can't help you at that time. 
Um, if you're able to pull up your vehicle to your booth, make sure that you unload everything and move your vehicle to the appropriate place before setting up. That is just common courtesy. Um, and then if you're not able to unload near your booth, it's a good idea to bring a hand cart, um, whatever variety you like, a dolly or whatever. Um, and then most importantly, be kind and patient with everyone. Um, setting up can be stressful and it goes more smoothly when people are nice and helpful to their neighbors. I have been at shows where people are not and it's very uncomfortable and a bad way to start a show. Um, so just be patient, everybody will help and things will get done and it's not the end of the world if something doesn't. So, um, so selling your work. Our fairs are an interactive endeavor. Um, People come out because they want to meet and talk to the artist. That's why they're not going to a gallery to look at your work or going to a shop to look at your work. They're coming out to talk to you. Um, so, stay in your booth. You can't sell your work if nobody's there to sell it. Um, we had someone come last year and went, and it was a five hour show and they went and took a two hour lunch. So, um, right. Uh, be there. Uh, greet people as they enter your booth. Um, ask if they have any questions. Um, don't use jargon that they might not understand. Um, part of my process is I do ceramics, but I do screen printing on my ceramics. So when I start explaining pe to people, a lot of people will be like, how did you get that on there? I first ask, well, do you know what screen printing is? I don't want to just automatically assume that they know. So it's okay to ask. Uh, if they if they know what you're talking about, and if not, back it up a little bit and maybe explain it in uh, layman's terms. Um, have some interesting facts about your te techniques um, or your inspiration that you can share. I actually wanted to ask you again. So about say about selling your work, I've actually heard a different a different approach that the artist should not be there. It should be someone else selling it, like a friend or an employee. Because they try and talk down the price to the artist, you know, since they're talking directly, and whereas the third person says, "No, I don't have a choice. This is what the price is." Interesting. And then also, um, what was the other school of thought? Mm -hmm. That like the artist to to indicate the artist will be here. Like an opinion used to be that the artist oh. would be here at certain times, so you could plan to be there if you wanted to ask him specifically. Hmm. But he wasn't there the whole time. So, would you say that now it's more the pendulum swung the other way that the artist should be there? I have never applied to a show where it hasn't said that the artist must be present. Okay. Yes. Is that what you're going to say? Okay. <laughs> Require you to be there all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's obviously, and we do it here too. There's there's breaks. We send around people to booth sitters to come give you a break. Um, generally that should be like 15 minutes or so, um, go to the bathroom, grab a drink, grab something to eat if you need to, um, but then you come back because even a booth sitter obviously doesn't know your work. It's a volunteer a lot of times that's just going to come and watch and make sure that people don't steal anything and say that the artist will be back. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I would, I would be in your booth. A, a friend or a family member that really knows your work and knows your techniques, that might be, that would be the preferred booth sitter, I would think. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I would be there. Um, let's see here. Um, if they don't buy it now, give them a business card, especially if they've been looking at it for a long time. Or maybe they've circled back again. Um, and maybe they still don't buy it, but like I said, if they've got a business card, they can get in touch with you later, whether that's through a website or an email. I wouldn't recommend putting a phone number on there, um, but that's up to you. Uh, let's see here. Don't ignore people. You know, be present in your booth. Like I said, greet them when they come in. Don't be staring down at your phone and looking bored. <coughs> but I'm an introvert, and that would be me actually at shows. So. Um, we can sell our work, I guarantee it. Um, you still must greet and acknowledge people, um, but there's other things you can do that are nonverbal to communicate um, information about your artwork. Um, first, these are information, but even just smiling at somebody when they come in your booth, 
can do wonders. Um, your body language, like I said, don't look bored or closed off. Don't sit there with your arms folded in front of you, not looking up. Um, some other things, though, to, to, discuss, to communicate information about your work um, is creating signage that explains um, your process or your techniques. Um, it can be pictures. Uh, if it's text, keep it short and, and, like I said, layman's terms that somebody could read it and understand what's going on. Um, limit the variety of your artwork. That way there's less to explain. Um, that might be for a, a printmaker, you know, I've got prints in this size, this size, and this size, and it's 10 different prints, you know? Um, or for a ceramic artist, it would be mugs, bowls, and cups, and that's it. Um, so that, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, that way there's less to explain if somebody does start to ask questions. Um, but always, always answer the questions and be friendly when you do it. Um, using packaging or labels that explain a specific piece. Um, if you're a painter and maybe you only have 10 or 15 pieces in your booth because they're all originals, it's okay to put like a little tag next to it that explains everything. What your inspiration was, what materials you used. Um, the same thing can be done with, with people that have um, a lot more pieces, but maybe it is like one placard with it that says, explains everything in this print bin. Um, so that sort of thing, or like for me with um, the pottery, you know, explaining that it's microwave and food safe, dishwasher safe, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then again, making sure everything's priced. Um, that way you don't have, pe people don't have to ask you what it is. Um, so you can do it even if you are introverted. Um, and then packing up and loading out. Hopefully the show went great. Um, you're energized from it. Um, but a lot of times that might not be the case. Um, you're tired. It's a drain to talk to people the whole time. Um, that sort of thing. Um, it, but uh, let's see here. Again, like loading in, a lot of shows may have a method to the madness of loading out. Um, so again, it might be um, the way that you pull your vehicle in or where you pull it in, what section of the festival gets to load out first. Um, but same thing as, as loading, as uh, checking in and loading in, pack up all of your artwork and your display before going to get your vehicle. Don't be the person that comes and pulls up the vehicle right away and takes up a spot, um, but you still have everything to pack up. Uh, and then again, and most importantly, be kind and patient. Um, everyone's tired and wants to go home. Um, it might be hot, you might be sweating. Um, ask your neighbor if they, if they need help. Um, be patient if there's a vehicle in your way. Uh, wish everyone well and tell them that you hope you see them at the next show. I think when you, when you do a show with somebody you didn't have a good day, they start packing early. Yeah. I mean, that's really, really bad that I mean, bad bad, bad man because then people leave the show so Right, yeah. Um, for the public, yeah. We've, um, packing up and leaving early, um, there's reasons to do it, but I don't recommend it, especially if you would ever like to be welcomed back to that festival. Um, it's obviously very noted when somebody packs up and leaves early. It's a blank space. Um, you see that person doing it. Um, even people who start to pack up parts of their booth before the show is over and start hand trucking them out to their vehicles, just don't do that. Like he says, it a lot of times will indicate to people attending the festival that oh, it's over, I've got to go ahead and rush out of here and get out of their way. Um, so just be patient, even if it's been a bad time, you're hot, you haven't sold anything. Um, stick around. Weather is a different story. Um, <laughs> they may ask you to pack up and leave early if the weather's bad. Um, that's something to note too. A lot of times if it's an outdoor festival and let's say a thunderstorm comes in and it's going to rain all day on the second day of the festival, they may call it, you're not going to get your money back. Um, I've had that happen a couple of times in the Midwest, but uh, that does happen. Uh, let's see here. Okay. 
So that's most of what I have. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. So when it comes to the states that you and a lot of people made when we first started, but that you can save us from, <laughs> what would this be? Um, Overcomplicated displays, mm -hmm. for sure, that you can't set up by yourself, um, or that take a long time to set up. Potters always are the last to leave a lot of times just because we've got to wrap everything up and protect it from breaking um, rather than just putting a lid on a print box and walking away. Um, but on top of that, I had a really complicated display when I first started. Um, let's see here, what else? Does anybody else have mistakes they've made? Volunteer with one of the festivals or events and figure out how things are. And we use volunteers to learn it out. Our city, Austin, yeah. I've contacted them now. The customer is in the email. I've been to a couple of events and said, I had to go. You need a volunteer. I'm interested. I did shows years ago and on e order. And I had beautiful cases for the furniture, but you had to come look down. Oh, uh huh. Um, and I just started working again at this and did a couple of small, just dipped my toe in a couple of small little shows. And I just decided to get a table. And I got a higher table mm -hmm. and had all my work out, despite the fact that it was nerve wracking. Right. Big difference. Don't make people work to see your work. Mm -hmm. Don't make them commit. Don't make them commit to come peer into something, do that that extra bit with your display to pull them in so that they don't have to um, peer at something right. so precious that they don't even want to bother. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes yes, but a lot of times no. They want you to commit to one, um, or you have to apply multiple times and have somebody else man your booth or be, be a, a studio partner or something like that that can represent your work. I've been working until recently and I've seen some of the cities you can apply to more than one category to give each of those cities an additional fee mm -hmm. for that category. Yeah, it kind of depends on the show. A smaller one, like last year we had um, someone who applied that was a potter and a fiber artist. And so she had um, art quilts hanging in her booth, but then the pottery in front of it. And we were okay with that. So it just depends on the show, too. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sales tax or income tax? Sales tax. Sales tax. Not income tax. Yeah. Um, if I mean, is there a limit? No, no I, you're supposed to report everything that you. Mm -hmm. You have to file with the bureau. Yeah. Okay, well, I've gotten, I've gotten my sales tax permit, I've gotten two mm -hmm. bills, and I've both sent them both in zero because I, I actually haven't done any sales yet. Yeah, so if it's zero, they're going to want $5. 
They don't. So, they don't charge that if you do it. No, no. What I'm saying is, the state of Texas wants to file if you had zero sales, zero dollars. Oh, I said, I said it that. Yeah. Said that had zero sales. Yeah. So if you make a sale of a dollar twenty-five, yeah, they're going to want that information because they want the zero dollar sale information. Mm -hmm. I see. Do you see okay. that? I see. Now, if you choose there's of course that, people who cheat the system. Yeah. Well, but I would not recommend that. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. No, and well, the one thing that's nice with that, um, it depends on how you um, filled out your application for your, your sales tax per mm -hmm. permit, but for me personally, when I first filled it out, they put me on quarterly reporting. That's what I was And so, I think that's an automatic for almost everyone, mm -hmm. but if they have you a certain, if you show a certain amount over time that you're not selling much, yeah. I'm now on yearly. Yeah, see, and I, and I, I think I signed up as just a, a resale, you know, mm -hmm. not a lot of dollars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that right. is it. Yeah, I think it's important, but I think the state decides when to make, you can't make that decision as to when right. to go yearly. Yep. Okay, I'll look at it. Okay. I work for the controller's office. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> probably go ahead and apply for one and I, I can talk more with you if you want to. It depends my, on my if it's on city work property. Really well, not. for like guerrilla style marketing, but I don't want to get in trouble and get my stuff right. taken away. For <coughs> you if know? you're if you're doing it on like a storefront property or something like that, then that <laughs> belongs to that store. And if they're saying it's okay, then right. then I would assume it's probably okay. If you're doing it on city property, that's different, and that's when you usually need a permit. City or state property. Where do you go to talk, what do you, who do you talk to about? If it's parkland, um, it's the Parks and Recreation main office and they'll, they'll push you to the special events office at Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. So you talked about, oh, you've done a fantastic job, thank you so much. And you've talked about a lot of different venues for selling our art. Mm -hmm. Well, I imagine the liability and the insurance is different for every situation, but is it always covered by the people putting on the show, or do we need to get some kind of liability insurance? That is up to you. A lot of festivals don't require that you get insurance, um, stuff on city property. Uh, the way that we did ours last year with a concessions permit, you are supposed to have insurance, um, but we didn't want to make every single artist get their own insurance, because a lot of, our show is also, we found really geared and, um, interesting to people that have never done it before, is what I figured out last year. It's a great professional development opportunity. Um, so instead of, again, making everybody get their own insurance in, a, in order to get that permit, 
um, our friends of group paid for event insurance and it covered everyone. So that is an exception to that. But a lot of times, um, yeah, it, it, it's up to you. If you go to a show and a storm comes through and blows your tent over and ruins everything and you've lost thousands of dollars worth of work and display, if you don't have insurance, I'm pretty sure that that festival probably doesn't have insurance for you either. Okay, you're talking about your life insurance, but what about if your store these falls and hits somebody on the head? That's, that's, that's kind of our own liability insurance. Right. If well, it well, happened, well. for us, happened on city property, yeah. our insurance covers that. So you have yes. to find the detail of the, of the, of the event, the right. event you're applying for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It only costs about five to six hundred dollars a year to do a lot of shows. Mm -hmm. You cover the damage to your booth and cover basic liability. So mm -hmm. The fifty dollars was the event, uh, the concessions permit for our show that we have this spring. Um, so, like I said, we don't charge uh, application fee or booth fee because we're a community arts center. Um, we're part of the city, and we don't, you know, we're here to support artists. So, um, we're not going to charge any of that. But you still have to. The city requires a, a permit to sell on city property. So that's that's what that concession permit costs for the day is fifty dollars. So that's how much our, we say our show is to do. You also mentioned the one uh, fifty dollars for if you don't pay your sales. Oh, that. Time, and yeah. Then you have to do the. You know, yep. Is that what you were we're talking? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So your sales tax permit. The late pickup. Yep. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, and even if you file late and it's it's zero dollars, you didn't sell anything. They're still going to charge you that fifty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I've been nailed multiple times, <laughs> which is why I'm glad I'm now yearly. Yes. There's also another good website. It's austinartalliance.org. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep. Austin yeah, and they send out, uh, I guess that's more of events that are currently taking place, but they do send out a weekly um, e newsletter that talks about um, show openings and festivals and that, that sort of thing. They actually put on Art, Art City Austin. Well, maybe there was a breakup, but yes. I, uh, one of the things that's been stopping me from going and doing more like pop-ups and stuff is the cost of all the booths and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any kind of good ideas or ways where you can find, I don't know, make it uh, more financially feasible? <laughs> like the booth fees or the display stuff? Display stuff. Or you just got to... Kind of do the research and do what you can do. Scrounge for stuff. Yeah. Stuff. Bricks, yeah. bricks, and cut up four by fours make great risers mm -hmm. and are cheap. Um, yep. Yeah. Just building wood stuff. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You know, like Round Rock, uh, Round Rock City, Round Rock has uh, three pop ups. Oh, do they? Yeah, okay, I didn't know about that one. <laughs> uh, but I'm just letting you know, it's, you know, they let you increase. You know, they might even supply the tents, so I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. So, are most pop-ups, like, It just depends. Um, if, it, if it's a pop-up at, like, a, a store or venue, yeah, they, they may not charge you, but if it's through something like Austin Flea or Craft and Draft or something, there's usually like a small fee, like maybe 10 bucks or 20 bucks or something like that. So what pricing, I'm a bookbinder and I'm actually writing one of those, and I have noticed that other people make hand on books for um, like 50 bucks or more, twice or so, and I used to sell them at 50 bucks, but it takes me five hours to make them much, and she will not be making much. Is there any way I could somehow charge 100 or 200 and then have people still buy it? <laughs> yep, I was just going to say that. So that could last another hour and a half or more. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's a whole debate all about pricing, and especially in the ceramic world, because there's people who have just come out of pottery class and have made mugs and are charging as much as I've 
charge for mine. So, you know, it is difficult. Um, there's also like a break in there too, which, which might be something with yours where if people like it and they've got the money, they will spend the money and they'll realize because it, they'll realize because it costs more that it's probably higher quality. It's like the Apple rather than the PC kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right, you want to Sure. <laughs> Doing business as, I don't have one. Oh, okay. So it's not like a done thing or, or a mandatory thing. As far as I know, no. Okay. I'm looking up at the mm -hmm. control images. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, I think so from a county level, it is. Because if you're doing the purpose of it is for property taxes, because even as a business, your assets are taxable in terms of like school yeah. taxes and all of that. That's what the county says too. Even yeah, but even so, working under your own name, you still going to have that issue. That's, right. that's your accounting CPA question. Um, so, yeah. The DBA is going to accept doing business as Margaret's house. I'm doing it as or the Red Spark. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'm just giving up business cards if you're still buying it. It does require buying it. It's not just going to be a business card. It's going to go to the office staff. Or, you know, it's like a very good business card. Um, I always hand out business cards. I mean, what you can get them super cheap, you know, pennies. Um, I always, yeah, if somebody buys something, I stick one in with it. Um, one, so that they remember, they might throw it away, but if they keep it, they might remember then who I am 10 years down the road when somebody says, oh, I love that mug, where'd you get it? Um, and that might lead to a sale down the line, or they want something more later after they've, um, it doesn't necessarily have to lead to a web store, um, they could contact you and find out where your work is located, either at a gallery or a show coming up, or maybe you can send them pictures of pieces that you have that are available. Um, so yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be to a web store. Um, I think you look at the shows with this pile, and if this pile really likes it, it's based on their birthday, so they can buy you a month, two months later, if you want to buy it as a gift to this pile. If you're doing thrifty, you can get a crew all right, I'm happy to keep answering questions too, but I see some people getting up. Thank you guys for coming out. We, we definitely appreciate if you guys fill out the survey and leave them on the table back there. Um, come out to the tax workshop with you.